you know, text it to me instead of uh, because then you're going to be on the recording. Okay, there you go. Good morning. Welcome to the iDesign alumni webcast on project design. I know most of you, if not all of you personally, but I know there's uh, quite a few people shadowing with the iDesign alumni in the background. So let me say a few words about uh, myself. My name is Valoi. I'm the principal of iDesign. At iDesign, we specialize in software architecture or system design, but just in breath, we also do project design, which is the subject of uh, today's uh, webcast. I've also been fairly active with the Microsoft uh, Technology Act, published some uh, six books, published lots of articles, I speak at conferences. Microsoft recognized me as a software legend, something they've only given for about six or eight people in the world so far. And I attribute a lot of that to my ideas, not just in software architecture, but also in project design, because you cannot succeed in software architecture without actually project design. When we set up to do this webcast, we asked the attendees what would they like to actually see, what we'd like to talk about in an hour-long session. And so this is a list of the topics almost all said the following. They said, we attended the architect masterclass. We understand why project design is so important, but we need to educate our colleagues, our bosses. We need to explain to them what this whole concept of project design is about. Could you give us a few pointers? And so I have a few slides on what and why in project design. Project design, by the way, is, is a vast topic. I mean, think about all the time it took you to reach your current level of understanding of software architecture. It didn't happen in a day, probably not in a year, maybe a decade. So there's an equivalent body of knowledge on project design. So we're not going to try and do all of that in, in an hour-long session, but I'm going to give you a hint. The other topic that almost every single alumni wanted to talk about is estimation. And probably because the pain level is so high when you feel you're being boxed into unfair estimation one way or the other. So you want to talk about how you do estimation, how do you push the right numbers, what does it mean? Then a whole set of small topics uh, came about like uh, critical paths and some resources work and how to work with tools and a bunch of other questions that we can group together as roles and responsibilities, who is doing what. And so we've got quite a full plate for this hour-long webcast. So I'm trying to uh, cover as much as I can in the order that you can like see it on the agenda now. And somewhere around towards the end, regardless of how much we manage to, I want to jump and talk about roles and responsibilities because it is very, very important. But it's a nice way of closing this whole thing uh, if we get to it in time. So what is project design? Much as you design the software system, you must design the project. Designing the project means accurately knowing how long it will take, how much it will cost, and not just a single coordinate, X and Y, it will cost as much, it will uh, uh, take this long. In many ways, there's several good ways of designing the project, much like there's several possible good architectures. All good architectures are, in essence, trade-offs, engineering trade-offs. And the same is true with project design. There's quite a few, several ways of designing the project, and all of them trade some degree of schedule and cost and risk with the other. So you trade some schedule for some cost or risk. And what you want to do is you want to present the decision makers with several good options. I like to say that you have to craft an environment where even bad managers make good decisions. And the way you do that is by only offering them good options. What you absolutely must avoid is no options. And that's a classic mistake. So the architect works on the architecture, come up with his grand design, everything is wonderful all the layers, the components, the services, and then they do a design review and the boss says, I like it, you have a year. And so there's a complete disconnect between the architecture versus the time that is given to do it and the resources. Who says that, in fact, that they're actually doable? And so you mustn't get to that point. You have to be the one, and you have to be proactive about it. You have to be the one providing the schedule, the cost, and even the risk 
with the architecture. Not as you validate your architecture in doing system design, meaning can this architecture address the required behavior, you have to validate your project plan. Can the team and the schedule that they have deliver on this project plan? Now, it turns out that devising a good project plan and answering these questions, all of it stems from the system design. This is not something that you can do without system design. You cannot design a project without knowing the architecture. Any attempt to do it is folly. You have to do the system architecture first. Out of that, you come up with a project to build it. It turns out addressing all the aspects of project design is a hardcore engineering task. And you apply very similar techniques of system architecture to project design. It, much like system architecture is not something the architect can do in isolation, project design requires both the project manager and the architect to find the best overall plan. Project design is not project management. It's a common misconception. The best way I can explain that sentence is that project design to project management is the same as system architecture is to programming. Project design is not something the project manager can do alone. He or she was never qualified or trained in the project uh, design techniques. The architect has to be the one providing that information, work with the project uh, manager. Project design enables you to provide visibility to shed light on dark corners. Often people don't want to hear the truth. But the fact that people have a tendency of averting the truth and reality it doesn't mean you should dust it under the carpet. In fact, the darker the corner, the more light you want to shine there. You really want to force managers to think through the work before it begins. They have to recognize all the indications. They have to understand what is involved before they commit to it. It's suicidal to commit to a project that's going to cost more or take longer than what is conceivably feasible. As the work starts, there's many project design cycles that things change and things are being dumped or changed. You have to do a mini project design cycle. And that actually forces managers again to think through the impact of change once the work commences. Just as important to stay on track all the time. What you want to do is in project design, you want to say, okay, what is the overall best plan that balances the architecture, the schedule, the cost, and the risk? And yes, absolutely project design also affects the architecture. Sometimes the project design imposes certain risk on integration. You would say, well, this is too risky. Can I do something in the architecture to reduce it? Project design is not building a clock. You don't want to nail it down to the last number second, but within reasonable certainty and, and, and acceptable risk, you want to see what's the cheapest way of building this system, what's the fastest way of building this system, what is the best approach, and so on. You really want to eliminate all the bad things that we see in software projects today. Most of the projects are a gamble. We can do it, we can't do it, let's toss a coin. Or it's a death match, let's do code like hell and hope for the best. Or we really, really think we could do it in a year. Or let's try it like this or try it like that. All of these things are horrendously wasteful. They're horrendously expensive. And if you do project design, these things literally go away. And a common question I get in what size of a project should you do, uh, should you have in order to justify the effort of project design? Well, first of all, project design doesn't take long. It can do a killer project design in a matter of a few days. But the real answer for the question is, suppose it's your money. Suppose you are taking all your life saving and you're trying to launch a new startup doing a great idea that you have, but your life saving is on the line. Wouldn't you like to do project design? Would you like to know how long it will take, how much it will cost, if it's feasible? The answer is, of course, yes. So my obvious observation here is, why are you being callous with the um, money of the company? If it's the company's money, then it's okay not to do project design. It's okay to do a death march. It's okay, it's okay to do gambling. It's okay to literally demotivate people for years and destroy their careers because of another failed project. The answer is, of course, no. So let's talk about the first area of project design that most everybody wanted to talk about more, which is estimations. The first thing you have to understand is that the common practice that people do when they do estimation, which is both underestimating and overestimating, are equally deadly. It's deadly to overestimate and it's deadly to underestimate. You really, really want to get a good estimation, and I cannot stress it enough. Now, the reasons why 
underestimation of Muslim is deadly are different. For underestimation, it's deadly. It's because the moment you give people too aggressive deadlines, they're going to let go of the best practices. They're not going to do enough testing. They're not document what they do. They're not going to invest enough in design. And by doing so, they will simply set themselves to fail. If you overestimate, you give people more time to do their work, and then the work simply expands to fill that load of time. That's Parkinson's law. And as a result, people are going to add more complexity, more goal plating, more things that they shouldn't really do. And by increasing the complexity of what they are working on, they actually decrease the overall probability for success. And what most people fail to understand is how nonlinear the probability decreases both for underestimation and overestimation. Here's a chart I also show in the architect masterclass that shows the duration of a task and the probability for success. And under N, I have normal estimation. Suppose you have a time machine, and this project can really be done in a year. You know that it can be done in a year because you went to the future, and you know in hindsight it took a year. My question to you is, what would happen if you give this project sort of a year, you give it a day? What would be the probability of success? And we know that the answer would be zero. And the answer wouldn't change if I say, what if I give you a lot more time than a day, maybe a week? The answer is still zero. What about a month? Zero. If you give a month for a year's project, regardless of how much energy you spend, the probability of success is zero. So with sufficiently aggressive deadlines, probability of success is zero. What about six months? Well, maybe 3%. Maybe a miracle is going to happen. What about 11 months, uh, three weeks, uh, and a day? Well, we feel very good about it. What about uh, nine and a half months? Well, I don't know, nine months for a 12-month project? I mean, where are you going to squeeze the other three months? I don't know. So what we see is that to the left of the nominal date, there is some kind of a tipping point, which is fairly close to the nominal estimation, where the probability for success drastically increases. Short of that, you're dead. On the other side of the nominal, are you going to be shocked to learn that the year's project has taken 13 months? And the answer, of course, is no. Now, because you're not going to be shocked, that's another way of saying probability is high. So if you go a bit to the left, probability stays more or less the same. But what about giving a year's project two years? Well, then gold plating and Parkinson's law will kick in. Probability of success would actually decrease again. And so what you see is that when you do estimation, you really want to be around the nominal area. A little bit over, a little bit under is fine, but you don't want to pad. You don't want to have a task that takes two weeks and say, well, I'm going to ask for three weeks. That is death. You don't want to have a task that uh, takes two weeks and you give a developer a week. That is death as well. And so no padding, no killer aggressive schedules. You want to get a good estimation. Now, good estimation tend to be accurate. They don't have to be precise. You're not looking down to the hour. Anytime I see somebody estimating things in hours or even days, it's kind of funny. Now, people have been hit on the head so much with bad uh, managers and bad estimations, they're now even afraid of giving a number, which is actually bad because a professional is not afraid of voicing an opinion. You can't go to the doctor and say, doctor, what's wrong with the doctor says, well, I mean, there's so many things, I don't really know. No, professionals are supposed to know what's going on. And so when confronted with unknowns, how do you deal with it? Well, there's a very easy technique, which is orders of magnitude. Think about a programming task of any sort. It doesn't really matter. Think about the project. It doesn't really matter what task. And ask yourself, what orders of magnitude will it take? Will it take a day, a week, a month, a year, a decade? Pick one of those points. And you would say, well, it's, it's, it's more like a month than it is a week or a year. Okay, so now we know it's a month. Is it uh, one month, two months, or three months? And so it is one to approach where you use orders of magnitude to talk about, even talk about the type of the unit. And then the second pass to zoom in on the value gives very, very good results. I also find that the basic unit, the resolution of estimation is always five days. Never try and go below five days. It's either... Five days, 10 days, 15 days, and such. It keeps things simple. You don't start splitting hair with three days or four days. Also, no task lasts four days. I mean, what are you going to do with the last day? And aligning it on the weak boundaries uh, tends to have two nice side effects. First of all, it reduces waste. Since tasks that don't last a week or don't take less than a week means there's some slack at the end that gets wasted. In addition, 
on some tasks are going to be over and some tasks are going to be under, but it tends to actually cancel each other out. And so if you keep the resolution fairly coarse, the overall estimation is actually going to be fairly accurate. In addition, aligning it on weak boundary makes MS Project looks great. It literally uh, aligns it on the weak boundary. You don't have tasks that start on Friday and all this nonsense. When it's time to do project estimation, there's actually two types of estimation. There's estimation for the overall project and then estimation for the individual tasks. And you need to do both. Estimating the overall project, I strongly recommend you use tools. Here's a screenshot of a tool called Estimate. It uses uh, an exponential model. It basically has a database of uh, projects. It runs through a wizard that tries to correlate your project type to the legacy uh, history that it has. It correlates things like programming language use, the number of developers, and the type, and, and the business COA. And that's a great way of uh, uh, estimating. I also recommend you keep history, look at past projects in the company, how long it took. These are all good numbers to look at. Now, why do you need to have an overall project estimation? It's a sanity check. Once you're done with the project design and you've broken down the activities and you summed it all up and such, that number should more or less correspond to the overall project estimation you did as a black box on the outside. The other use for overall project estimation is to reduce uncertainty. You say, well, I don't even know what the individual activities are, but I know if I sum it all up, it's going to be just like the overall project. So it's a way for you to box in the, the effort. Another technique for overall project estimation is broadband. We literally involve all the team in the effort. And what you want to do is you want to tap into the synergy of the combined brain of the group. I like to say that 10 people should have the IQ of 1,000, not 80. Not everybody knows everything. But if you know, somebody that something, if you know something that somebody else does not, you can share it. People have different experience, different perspective, different intuition, different approach for risk. And what you do is you get everybody in the room, you ask them, give us two numbers. How long it will take? How many people are required? Just two numbers. You take all the numbers, you put it in Excel, and you calculate the mean and the standard deviation. Then you highlight the outliers, those that were at most, that were at least one standard deviation away from the mean. And you say, OK, everybody said seven guys. You said three. What do you know that nobody else does? Well, maybe this whole thing is available with this SDK. You change the logo, and it's done. Well, everybody said uh, seven, you said 20. What do you know? Well, once you go to the cloud with the queues and the certificates, the whole thing is a mess. So you let the outliers voice the additional context, additional information. And then everybody gets to weigh in that additional information, and you do it again. And you keep doing it until everybody agrees or until the standard deviation stops moving. So if the standard deviation after iteration after iteration stays within two guys, two guys, two guys, then you say, okay, we have converged. Or if the standard deviation goes below one person, you say, okay, that, that's good enough. I did it last week, uh, and it converged after the third iteration. So it doesn't take long. It's a very effective uh, technique. When, you, when it's time to do it, don't just get developers. Get a diverse group. Get the new guys and the old guys. Get the guys with the devil advocates. Get the stakeholders in the project, managers, support guys, uh, marketing guys. They, they know a lot about your project without you actually realizing it. Get those who specialize in particular areas, get the generalist. Get those who are creative, get those who can just crank code like crazy. You also want to get a good sized group. I say the number it should be about a dozen to 30 people to get a good dynamic here. And what you want to do is you want to get the law of big numbers on your side where uh, the sum of the errors is going to be less than the errors of the sum. And, and that's going to be basically uh, a good size to work for. When you're doing something, thing, you want to have an open atmosphere. You want to have people voicing their concerns and highlighting risk and not being perceived as criticism over management, over the plan they're going to choose. By and large, it's a good thing to identify uncertainties. Most long estimations are because of uncertainties. And again, the use of the orders of magnitude is a great technique for narrowing down uh, that much. Now, while uh, um, broadband estimation or using tools tend to be fairly accurate, they don't replace properly doing project design. And the reason is you still have to do all the project design to assign the work for developers, to understand the risk involved, 
to understand other trade-offs and, and other options. So these broadband techniques are a good sanity check, but they're not really actionable on their own. But you still have to actually do the project design. Then there's a whole world of service-based estimation where you really, really want to estimate per activity in the project. So it can be per activity, per owner. So if you know somebody's going to do a particular service, you need to get an estimation from that guy. There's something I call the estimation dialogue. You never want to land an estimation. You want to say, you have two weeks. Because whatever answer the guy's going to give is going to be wrong. If he says yes, well, they just agree to something they have no idea what it's about. If they say no, they, they keep saying no. And in the architect master class, I hammered the point that the only answer for the question, how long it will take, is let me get back to you. You really want them to go and give you a good number. There's no way of flipping a number. This can't be done unless there's some reflection going on and they have to sit down and look at the history or do some research and try and break it down and estimate how long will it take. Often the number they come back to you would be partly cooked because it would only mean, well, here's uh, how long it will take to code it. But they would fail to account for the learning curve or writing test clients or setting a code review or writing a manual. So you really want to force them to itemize all of those things. You really want to get good numbers. Remember the probability for success. So that was the hot topic of estimation. So with every project design, you have to do the estimation for the old project and for the individual tasks. So don't even think for a second that you don't have to estimate or that you can't estimate. You can and you will. So now that you have that done, let's talk about some fundamental concepts in project design. And again, I'm going to go through maybe 15 slides here. I have 700 slides on this in the project design masterclass. So this is just some really, really fundamental concepts. An activity is something that happens in the project that requires time and resources. It doesn't mean necessarily just coding. If somebody goes on vacation, well, that somebody takes time, and that is unavailable for anything else. So even that is an activity in the project. So everything that happens, service construction, testing, even project planning itself is an activity in the project, going for training. All of that are activities. In essence, the project is a collection of related activities. And what you want to do is you want to come for a model of how these activities relate to each other and how these things are designed uh, to behave. And it's very much like the architecture is a model of the system. If you think about what you call the architecture, it doesn't matter if it's a software system or architecture of a house, it's a figment of your imagination. The architecture doesn't exist. I'm now sitting in a room. I can look at the walls. I can bang on the door with my hand. I don't see any architecture. Now, if you were to go and point at a piece of paper and say there's some blue lines and that's the architecture, and I would say nonsense. This is a piece of paper with some blue lines. So the architecture is merely a model. It is a figment of your imagination. And what it allows you to do is allows your brain to wrap itself around the system. But it's a model. That's all it is. With project design, there's exactly the same concept. It's a network diagram. It shows how these activities relate to each other. It is exactly the same as the architecture for the system. The network is the same for the project. It's a model of the system. Now, not only it enables you to model the system, something else magical happens. It enables your brain to relate to it, to almost like personify, just like we talk about the architecture as if it's real, it's the same here. Without it, you would fail. Without it, there is no concept of a project. In order to do the modeling of the network and then the critical paths, you have to have all of these uh, prerequisites. You have to decompose the system already into services. The architecture has to be done. You have to know what it is you're going to build. You also have to know what is the relationship as far as dependencies between the services? Service A needs B, and service B needs C. The classic way of finding out the dependency tree is by the use cases. So if you look at how the architecture is designed to support the required behavior, which is the use cases, that is actually done by collaboration between those services. And so if you simply look at the way the use cases, the core use cases, are, affected, are implemented by the architecture, and that's a good start at building a dependency tree. You have all the known code activities. There's no way of looking at the architecture and identifying out of it something like system testing or user uh, interface design. 
You also need the effort estimation per activity, which we discussed before. And you also need the available resources. It's a very different network and a very different project design depending on the resources. In fact, you have to build several networks depending on the resources available. So it's not just a single solution. It's a multiple pass uh, solution. Next, I recommend you convert dependencies of the services into some kind of an abstract graph. The abstract graph is a good way of also accommodating the non-coding activity. There's no way of looking at service dependencies and seeing non-coding activity, but if it's an abstract graph, it's a lot easier. And what you want to do is simply draw something. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to come up with the longest possible path in that network. And the classic way of doing that is starting with the last activity and kind of walking us back, asking how long will it take to complete this network. So here is a simple example of a project network. The various uh, nodes here are already some kind of activities in the project. And answering the question, how long will it take to get to activity number 18, is very similar. It's the time it takes to implement 18 plus all the time it took to do 17. OK, how long it took to do 17? Well, it's the time it took to implement 17 plus the max between 2 and 16. Well, obviously, it's 16, so let's go from 16 to 11. And you kind of like walk backward, looking for the longest possible path connecting the very first activity to the very last activity. That longest possible path is called the critical path. And the critical path is the quickest possible way this project can ever be built. And this is so important, I'll have to say it again. What you try to do is look for the longest possible path from the start to the end of the project. That longest path is called the critical path. It represents the quickest possible way the system can ever be built. This is actually the only way to answer how long will it take. There is no other way of answering how long it will take. It's not as if you take all the services, estimate the effort for every single one of them, sum it all up, and divide by the number of developers, and that's how long it will take. That's complete nonsense. That's like saying nine women can produce one baby in one month. That's absolutely not true. The only way to answer that question is doing critical path analysis. Now, once you realize that the critical path is actually the duration of the project, other things come out of it. The first is resource allocation. When it's time to assign resources for the project, you always assign them to the critical path first. And the reason is assigning them outside the critical path doesn't accelerate anything. But slowing down the critical path absolutely slows down the project. Take it a step further. The best resources must always go to the critical path. That is where your risk is. It doesn't matter what the developers are good at, what they think they like to do. Best resources always go to the critical path. Now it's time to do staffing, what you're trying to do is you're trying to look for the smallest staffing level that allows you to progress along the critical path. What does that mean? If you look at, uh, at this network, you would ask yourself, how many people do I need at the beginning of the project? Well, at the beginning of this project, you need at most two guys, because one guy can do activity three, and the second guy can do activity two. But if you give me a third guy, he's going to be playing foosball in the cafeteria. There's nothing for the third guy to do. Now, suppose you're done with activity three. How many people do you actually need? Well, I could use at most six guys, but I'm probably going to go here with maybe four. So the first guy is going to do activity six, which is on the critical path, and the second guy is going to do activity four, and then nine, and then 14. And I maybe have four guys, and then I keep going up. I say I only need three, so I get the fourth guy to knock maybe activity 14, and then I'm doing uh, 12 and eight and two and so on. So basically what we're trying to do is trying to ask yourself, what is the lowest level of resources that enables me to progress unimpeded along the critical path? When it's time to capture the project network, there's two classic notations. There's no diagrams and arrow diagrams. No diagrams are what I've showed you so far. You capture each activity in a node. Arrow diagram, you capture each activity as an arrow between two start and completion events. No diagram are more intuitive no diagram is what tools like MS Project or Visual Studio Architect are using. Unfortunately, you should use arrow diagrams. And the reason is the following. Look at the two representation we have here of an arrow diagram versus a node diagram. 
Suppose I have activities A, B, and C, which are related to activities D, E, and F. That's actually fairly common in software projects. Imagine A, B, and C are some resource access, and D, E, and F are some business logic activities using it. In the node diagram, it looks like a spider on LSD drew that network. It's impossible to understand what is going on. L diagram just make all that clutter go away. So even though node diagram are more intuitive, even though the tools all use node diagram, I still recommend use L diagram. So here's a fairly complex project I worked on last year. This one has about 100 activities. This one is in L nodes, in L diagram, not in node diagram. You can see in bold the critical path of this network. And think about this project that has 100 activities. It only has one line crossing. If you look at the lower right coordinate, you would see one line crossing. That's it. That's the power of our diagram to uh, demystify these diagrams. Now, there's more to assigning resources than I discussed so far. Critical activities have to be done back to back, back to back, back to back for you to actually finish the project on the time you commit to. But non-critical activities can float. They don't have to start immediately. And that means if you don't have to start them immediately, you have to ask yourself a simple question, why should I strive to start them immediately? If you start them immediately, you would need higher degree of resources. So you can actually use the degree of float of activities as the key for assigning resources. Now, obviously, if you have activities that have fairly low float, but let's call them near critical. If you have an activity with, say, two days of float, then that's almost critical. That activity should get the resources first compared to an activity that has 15 days of float. And so the true way of actually assigning resources is actually not just assigning along the critical path. It's also looking where the float is and assigning them with the uh, uh, notion that you only assign resources where the float is near critical, and after that, somewhere in between. I like to even do color coding. So here's a project from uh, uh, one of the iDesign uh, customers. Let's just uh, leave it at that. And what you see here is the following. I scrubbed away all the notions and nodes and the labels and such. You see in black the critical pass. And everything that's not in black is there for non-critical. But what I did here, I did color coding. And I put in a number, the degree of the float each one of those activities has. Now, suppose you are on the beginning of the fourth activity, where there's this big red, black, and some orange. So obviously, if you have one guy, you assign him against a critical pass. If you have a second, you give them to activity that has float of five. If you have a third, you activity with a float of 10, and a fourth, activity 15, and so on. And that is how you go and assign the resources. And it's the most risk reduction oriented approach you can possibly have. It's also the most economical way of doing it. You're not just assigning them blindly. You're just assigning where they need to so that you can proceed with the lowest level of resources along the critical path. Now, also note that sometimes resource availability may dictate when activities are done beyond the logical dependencies between the services. So you could have a service that needs other services, and that dictates dependency on network. But what if you don't have the resources required to do the services you depend on by the time it's time to do that service? So I say resource dependencies are dependencies. It doesn't really matter that it's not a code dependencies. And so if you know in advance some resource constraints, like you're not going to have more than two or four developers or some number, you have to actually design the project network while taking the resource dependencies into account. And that will actually give a different network. So the full formula for assigning resources for activities is based on the following. You assign against the critical pass, of course. You assign where the floats are low, of course. You also have to look when are the resources available in the first place that affects the network. And you may have some constraints, meaning you can only get four developers, but two of them are only available after June or some other constraint. Every constraint actually requires you to fork a different plan with a different contingency and a different everything. And you have to show all of these things to management, show how, this, how the constraints they impose affect the project design. Next one that I'd like to introduce is something called the time cost uh, curve. 
And I think we're all convinced, and we've seen it firsthand, that there's no way to accelerate a code like help project. And the reason there's no way to accelerate a code like help project is because you're already coding like hell. That's why you can't accelerate it. Everybody's already uh, steaming, all the pistons are cranking, there's no way to accelerate it. But that is not even the beginning of how bad it is. Not only is there no way of accelerating a code like hell, it turns out code like hell is not the fastest way of building a system. And the reason is, when you're doing code like hell, you assign tasks or you choose to do things simply across the critical path. You just have a shotgun blast against the critical path. And some activities are on the critical path and some are not. But by doing things that are the critical path first, or regardless of the critical path, you're not accelerating anything. It turns out that code like hell is also not the cheapest way of building a system. In fact, it's a horrendous, horrendous, horrendous waste. Simply doing coding like hell means that things that you depend on already or things that uh, you're working on should not be worked on at all. It's a horrendous waste. It also doesn't allow you to level the resources with the lowest amount of risk against the critical path that you simply do not acknowledge. So code like hell can't be accelerated, not the fastest, not the cheapest. What's to like? It turns out well-designed projects are the fastest way of building a system. And the reason well-designed projects are the fastest way of building a system is because you assign the resources along the critical path, not across the critical path. It is as simple as that. Now, we also know that no project can be accelerated beyond its critical path. We know that is, that is truth. So how can you accelerate the project? And the solution is very simple. You compress the critical path. Now, to understand compression, we have to recognize something. By and large, time and cost are not linear in a project. If I have a 10 man year project, giving it for one guy will take 10 years. But if I give it for two guys, it's not going to take five years. So it's going to take six years. If I want to do it in five years, I would need three guys. So the cost points that we have here are 10, 12, 15. But the time points that we have were basically 5, 6, and 10. So we basically get this uh, kind of like a power function that shows how cost changes in the project. And that is true axiomatically at any project. This has nothing to do with your project. All human efforts behave this way. This also has to do, by the way, with the second law of thermodynamics and there's some other things why this is so. So don't try and change the nature of the universe. Your project will behave this way. However, this is the idealized curve. This is not the real way that project actually behaves. Now, we discuss in a second why. It turns out that if we spend more, we can accelerate the project. So it's, it's foolhardy to think that we have to do it at a particular time. If you want to spend more money, you could actually do it uh, faster. For example, it stands to reason that the world's best developer is not working on your project right now. But if you pay enough, you may want to get the world's best developer. But you don't have to go to the extreme of the world's best developer. If you look at junior developers that are routinely killing the programming task, imagine you had a senior guy that actually knows a thing or two about proper uh, techniques and proper programming and defensive programming and all the good practices that we know. How much faster is it going to be done with senior developers instead of senior junior developers? But you know, senior developers cost more than junior developers. We know the critical impact of People like test engineers. Test engineers are like adding a little bit of manure to your garden. They don't replace the soil, but they contribute to productivity at an immense measure. And so even just having a single or two test engineers that are writing software whose sole purpose is to break your software will increase productivity to an incredible degree. Now, we're not talking about quality here. We're talking about productivity. If you invest in quality, you will get productivity. And the reason is you spend less time coding, uh, so you spend less time debugging, you spend more time adding features. It's as simple as that. By extension, also adding testers. And we all know that having one test monkey for 10 developers is not a good ratio. What if you have one to one or even two to one? Two testers for every developer. For every one guy writing code, there's two guys banging on it, trying to break it. What about investing in infrastructure? Investing in logging, security, automation, builds, 
deployment, certificate management, uh, message instrumentation and profiling, all that good stuff that we know would help you hit the ground running. What about simply training the developers and investing in good process and uh, maybe even project design? What about adopting a standard or even taking a standard and then tuning it for the specifics of how you do business? What about doing requirement review, code review, design reviews? All of these things are not free. Doing something like code review is pure overhead. There is no added value whatsoever to code review. But what's the alternative? Think about all the things you can do in parallel, writing the UI uh, in parallel to the requirements, designing the UI, writing simulators for services, all of these crashing activities. What about doing quality assurance? I'm not talking about quality control. I'm talking about somebody that looks at the entire process from the top and say, how could we change it to increase quality? All of these things will cost you more. All of these things will enable at the end of the day to ship it sooner. Now, crashing in project design means I want to do the same work faster. And there's really only two ways of doing that. One is getting better resources for doing it. And the second is finding a way of doing some of this work concurrently. These are the only two ways of crashing something. Now, project crashing means I'm not going to go into individual activities and try and crash them. I'm just going to change the dependencies or maybe break them down to enable uh, accelerated schedule. And if you look at any programming task, you can absolutely say, well, do we have to do all of these activities Serially, or can we do it parallelly? In the extreme, I could take the requirements for any service and in parallel work on different design for that service and a test plan. And I can even work on a test plan in parallel for doing the um, actual construction. And what if that service to begin with is required by other downstream services? Well, that service is now gating them. They can't actually progress doing their work. So you know what I can do? Maybe the first thing I do is a simulator for all the services I require, and then I'm going to proceed doing my work. So all of these things are crashing techniques in software, enable you to crash the project. Now, the point of the previous two or three slides is simply to show you that there's always a way of doing the same work faster. And it's true, by the way, for individual tasks. It's true for the entire project. So now, the time cost curve combined with the critical path does something very interesting. So let's call the first approach we did for project design so far the normal solution. Normal solution means I take the dependency between the services, I take the effort estimation, and I assume unlimited resources. Meaning, I assume that if I need three or four developers, I get them. And if I need seven, I get them too. And I'm not going out of my way to get the seventh developer, but if I need to, I will do it. So I'm saying designing the project with unlimited resources but with an eye for least direct cost. I'm trying to do it with the least amount of cost, but I'm not throttling the availability. As a result, I would always be able to progress along the critical path without slowing it because all the supporting activities are going to be done because I assumed unlimited, activity, unlimited resources. Now, suppose we have that record the normal solution. What if the normal solution is a year, but I give you a year and a half or a year and a quarter? Is it going to cost more or less? Well, of course, it's going to cost more. It's going to cost more because of several things. First of all, parking will not kick in, complexity will increase, gold plating, and so on. But also, as the project takes longer, all the overhead, the manager, the project manager, the HR, the, the testers, all of those things which don't contribute to value directly are going to keep spending over a long period of time. So if you simply go longer than normal, cost always increases. You go into some kind of a non-economical drag out. Now, the other point is, let's call it least time solution. What's that? We know that we can apply crashing techniques to accelerate the project. But should we apply it on all the activities in the project? And the answer is absolutely not. There's only reason to crash activities on the critical path. Crashing activities outside the critical path doesn't accelerate anything. So you look at the critical path, and you choose activities on it to compress, to crash them. Should all activities be crashed? No. Are all activities the same? No. You only crash activities that give you the best bang for the buck. If I were just to assign one more tester over here, the whole thing is cut by half or whatever. You want to look for the best return on investment here. 
So you pick the best candidate on the critical path and you crash that one. Now, as you crash it, the critical path gets shorter. What do you do now? You pick another activity on the critical path and you crash that one, the second best candidate. What happens now? The critical path again gets shorter. As you keep shortening the critical path, at some point the critical path may no longer be the critical path because another path that you didn't apply any crushing love so far now becomes a longer in the project, at which point you stop and you jump to that one and you crush activities over there. And you keep doing it and keep doing it and keep doing it. At some point, you have reached the least duration of the project. There's either no more activities to crash or all paths become critical. So let's call that the least duration solution. There is no way of doing this project any faster. Note how different this is from code like hell. Know how engineered that approach was. Then there's another point that's called the all crash solution. All crash solution, you go in, in a brute force manner, you crash all activities in the project regardless if they are on the critical path or not. You're not going to do it any faster than least time, but you are going to actually spend more. So the actual behavior of a project typically looks like this. This is the non-idealist curve of a project. Here we have the normal solution as the least cost um, point on a project. To the right of it, we have some non-economical drag out. Then we have some kind of infinite points in between normal solution and least time. Then we have all crash that just goes vertically up and there's nothing you can do about that. That is truly the behavior of your project. Now, when you're doing project design, you're not going to come up with infinite points in between least time and normal solution. So project manager and architect should provide some one or two practical points in between because what they do is they actually trade some schedule for cost and for risk. And it turns out most managers choose those points. So when you're doing project design, it typically looks like this. You do the normal solution first, that's easy. You do maybe the least time because, you know, we can actually not uh, stock even do that. And then maybe some points in between. So we're not talking about infinite points. A good project design comprises of uh, three to five points on the curve. And you basically present all of these points to measure. Say, look, boss, here's are the options of doing this project. And you actually plot them. In my experience, is that most managers would not go for the cheapest or most expensive option nor would they actually go for the fastest or slowest option. So if you have a 10 menu project, have you ever encountered a manager that would say, let's do it with one guy for 10 years? And the answer is no. So they would absolutely not go doing it the cheapest. So any time the manager says, I'm going to do the cheapest, they actually not know what they're talking about. And suppose in theory it would be possible to get 3,650 people and do this project in a day. Would any manager ever choose that? And the answer is also no. So they're likely to maybe choose 14 guys for a year and a half or some point in between. You want to provide these points. Now, there's some classic mistakes here, which is scheduling below list duration. So the architect does the architecture, and then the manager um, picks some kind of a date. And that's actually wrong. You don't want to schedule below list cost. Now, there's something I'm going to show you here, which is feasibility. Points above the curve are doable. By doable, I mean it would take longer for doing it for the same cost, or it would take longer for the same cost, but it's actually doable. Points under the curve are impossible to commit to. No amount of cost or effort or sweat could change it. So it actually looks like this. So in red, we still see the time cost curve. Above it, we see the area of feasible solutions. They're not optimal, but at least they're doable. But beneath that, we see the death zone. If you choose a schedule and cost point below that in the death zone, the project has failed before anybody has written the first line of code, which is such an amazing conclusion you can actually do, that you can reach, meaning a week into a project design, you already know what are the best ways of killing this project. And you also know what is actually possible. So we're almost out of time, so I want to um, go and talk about roles and responsibilities. It's the job of the architect and the project manager to work on project design. Project design hinges on the architecture and the resources and the time. 
Now, the architect has the insight and perspective on topics like architecture, technology, dependency between services, design constraints, this needs to be done before that, and uh, Joey can do this, and Mary can't do that, and the architect has that insight. Project manager has the insight and perspective on this whole soup of how much resources actually cost and how many resources are going to be available and can we use certain factors on some of these things or not and what should be higher priority to do in this stage versus that stage and the politics meaning we should not get that service from those guys because of this and because of that. All of these things are actually project design uh, boundary conditions you have to take into account. The architect needs to plan. You need to design the project, do the critical pass analysis. As a technical manager, two things happen. You're the only one that has the insight for how to do these things properly, and the only one that even has the personality traits for doing these. Doing proper project design is a design task, and architects are doing design. Project managers need to track the project. Once the project is approved, they need to actually keep tracking it and keeping it on track and changing the levels of control to keep it on the plan. During execution, when things change, both the architect and the project manager must close the loop and put it back on a good uh, track. Typically, it means another mini iteration of project design. If you don't do these things, either upfront or through the execution, it feels as if the project is trapped in a giant pinball machine. And it goes up, 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 bing, 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 bing. And it being whacked on the head and turn left and turn right. Maybe it makes its way out the door, maybe not, nobody knows. And you keep banging on the levels of the pinball machine trying to affect its behavior. I like to say that the critical path is there, whether you acknowledge it or not. If you're doing multiple things in your project right now, and our dependence is there, you have a critical path. It doesn't really care if you plan against it or not, it's just there. To so put differently, the job of the architect is to analyze the system and the project to design both and recommend options. But at the end of the day, the project manager is the one that needs to support the architect in doing this, to provide the input, to advise on certain trade-offs, and ultimately even make the decision. I said that designing a plan, that is designing software system without a plan of how you're going to build it is pointless. Nobody would design a refinery without a plan of how you build a refinery. Nobody would design a microchip without a plan of how you're going to manufacture it. Don't be astronaut architects that just float there out in space with the concept of an architecture, but not tied to reality of how it's actually going to get constructed. The flip side for the project managers in the room is that the project cost and the schedule are always derived from the architecture and the resources. Don't be an empty suit project manager that thinks that you can commit for a schedule and a cost and then shove some kind of architecture and system into it because that's never going to work. To manage to execute complex software projects requires to be intimately familiar with the architecture and to continuously close the loop here and to cooperate with the architect. And that is actually a non-traditional approach. Traditionally, architects address the concept of maintainability, reuse, extensibility, scalability, security, all the good stability concepts that make for great system architecture. And we came up with architectures and design solutions that satisfied these things. My message to you today is that you must add to that list resources and cost and scheduling risk that are just as much part of system architecture as dependency between services or security. Addressing all of these things together is an engineering task. These are not something that uh, mere paper pushing measures can actually do. They can make facilities that work, but they can't actually do it. We're almost out of time. Some resources for you. There's some resources on the other website regarding project design, and we intend to provide more. The project design masterclass in July is now sold out. It's been sold out for a few weeks now. There's so much interest in the project design masterclass that we're beginning to contemplate maybe a private class for the alumni and friends. So if you're interested, please uh, contact Beth. The Architects Masterclass has about half a day to a day on project design and all the other things the architect has to do. The next Architect Masterclass is August this year. You have here a few links on project design and the Architect Masterclass from the iDesign uh, website.
And so that was the last slide. Beth, are we doing on time? All right. Well, we want to thank everybody for attending today. Um, we are recording the session, and I'm going to see if I can't make that available. Uh, keep an eye on the alumni list. I, I will post uh, if we're going to have that available. Good. So, I'm going to stop the recording now. I'm going to take some questions. I did see a question on how you determine the number for the float. Ah, excellent question. So, let me flip to uh, some kind of a slide when able to talk about it. Okay, so look, say, at the path between 3 and 11. Suppose 3 is the first activity, so its time is 0, and suppose you get uh, to activity 11 on day 60 of the project. Suppose activity 9 takes 10 days, so the float for 9 is 50. It's the, connect, it's the difference between this point and that point. And so that's a very simple answer for the question. There's more to it because 3, 9, 11 is an, a chain that has one activity on it. What if it's a more complex, non-critical activity like 3, 14, 13, 11? Well, in which case, 14 and 13 actually share the float because not only is the difference between 3 and 11 minus the sum of 13 and 14, suppose 14 is a hog and consumes all the float, then 13 actually immediately becomes critical. So when you're talking about floats, or in this case total floats, all activities on a cold chain share the total float. And total float are the number I was referring to during project design. There's another float which you use in project management not project design called free float, which is to what degree can you move a non-critical activity before it bounces against another activity you've already scheduled. That's called free float. It's less relevant for project design, much more relevant for um, project management. Free float is not simple to calculate because it has dependencies on downstream activities. It requires some spreadsheet or some MS project to do. But by and large, that's how you do it. All right, more we questions? have time for one more question. Sure. All right, we've got a couple. Um, let's see, we've got a question about how it works with waterfall and a question about tools. Okay, so how does what is waterfall? Waterfall doesn't really work, so it doesn't really matter. Um, so it doesn't really matter in that respect. Um, project design is, I know it sounds strange, is highly agile. You spend only a few days answering the question, I'm going to take how much it will cost to better understand which design option of the project you're going to choose. And once you go there, you can actually do deep design on the project, and you can actually do specific iterations and sprints. All of that is good. So it, it's, it's very similar to architecture. How does architecture relate to waterfall? Well, I mean, you can have a waterfall with a phase called architecture, you can have a waterfall with a phase uh, project design, but Waterfall itself doesn't really work. Right, I think we More questions? Oh, we had, had something about tools. Yeah, who wants to know about tools? Um, the question about tools? Yeah, the question is what tools are recommended for project plan? And is there a uh, way to help drawing the arrow diagram in a better way than manual? I have never seen any tool that does arrow diagram. And I think tools. All the drawing tools are no are only doing no diagrams. So at the end of the day you're gonna to have to do it manually because I've never seen a tool that does arrow diagram. I don't know why this is so. Maybe there's a technical limitation. Maybe drawing tools cannot do arrow diagram, I can only do no diagram. I, I don't know. The tools I use are of course PowerPoint, the best design tool there is. Um but you know, why are you asking about project design? What about system architecture? How come we don't have good tools for system architecture, right? So I use the three tools I use when doing project design. I do PowerPoint for the diagrams. I do MS Project for the actual scheduling of tasks, because MS Project is awesome at scheduling individual activities. And uh, MS Project is great for calculating things like float. 
and I use Excel for the actual active project design as I'm looking at the shape of the critical uh, path, I'm looking at the shape of the project plan, all of the things I tend to do in Excel where I've got infinite control over the calculations and everything else. So I end up doing project design in PowerPoint, Excel, and MS Project. And in the project design class, I have like seven labs where I people, make people go and use the tools and I show the shortcomings of the tools. I guess the best message I, can, message I can give you about tools is you should use tools for what tools are good for. Tools are good for mechanical calculation, for repetitive tasks, for things which are error prone for humans. Tools absolutely suck at anything which is creative. Tools cannot do a great network diagram. Even if you had a tool that does network diagram, I assure you it would look with crossed lines, it would look horrible, you're going to have to manually arrange it. So use tools for the things which we as humans don't do very well, like repetitive work on many calculations of date and such, and use what we use people for what we are good at, which is creative work and arranging and working constraints into things and heuristics and intuition. These are all things people do much better than tools. And, and no attempt using MS Project load leveling would ever come near the intuition you have on what's the right way of doing it. All right, do you more want to questions? do one more question? Um, we have a sure. question of how does the critical path change with the change in requirements and what are the repercussions? Apple juice and donkeys. Requirements don't change the critical path. Requirements are what you're required to do. Out of the requirements, you come up with the architecture, which is the decomposition into services. The decomposition into services lets you know the dependencies. And after that, you basically end up with the critical path. So all of that has nothing to do with the requirements. You should come up with the best architecture in the first place so that changing the requirement does not change at all, the decomposition into services. It mainly means a different interaction between the services, your existing building blocks. Now, what may happen is that if priorities and requirement change, or things are dumped on you, you're supposed to do, or, or some other constraints, that things you were supposed to do maybe in a different phase in the project are now actually dumped on you, you have to do it now. Well, it changes everything. Now we have a new activity to do. In the interest of the architecture, but you have a new activity, so you have to do this entire thing. You have to do the, uh, uh, the project design network and the resources and everything else. But it's not that the there was ever a change in the requirement. There was perhaps a change in the priorities or in the scheduling of the things you were supposed to do. It's not that the requirement actually did change. Good, so we are right on the hour mark. So I want to thank you all for uh, joining this inaugural webcast for the alumni. We hope to do more of them. Have a good day and a good week otherwise.